But then as we kind of got into it, it felt more comfortable. It felt more natural. And here I was quoting my neighbor and saying, acting like I, like I know, like these are my words, like I'm the expert here and saying, man, you just got to know that it's the right thing and you just got to keep doing it. <laughs> but it's the same, right? It's the same. God has given us the abilities, whether whether physical or emotional or spiritual. God has given us abilities. He's, he's infused us with these abilities. Maybe for some of you guys, last Sunday night was your first experience going out and doing evangelism ever, maybe, in your whole Christian life. Maybe that's the first time. Or maybe you're whatever the spiritual equivalent of formerly athletic is, Right? Now, like, we go out and we start walking in the community and we start going, man, I remember these muscles. I remember how to exercise these. I remember how to do that. And then what happens is a couple weeks later, you'll look up. And you finish your workout, and instead of feeling sore, you feel really good. You feel really positive. And you feel like you did something beneficial, Right? And it's not sore anymore because I'm exercising those muscles every day. And it's amazing to me how those two things in my life have tied together at the same time for God to illustrate this powerful point to me. Because what I saw last week was a church going out and being the church. And I saw some people exercising their brand new baby Christian muscles for the first time. And then I saw some others who you could tell used to be really fit in the past, but maybe not as sharp anymore. And there we all were together, out exercising and being beneficial to our church and our community. And so I just want to encourage you this morning. I want to tell you, and don't get this, don't take this the wrong way, because what I'm about to say could be taken the wrong way. Morning. There is no set of actions that you can do no set of good deeds that you can do that will get you to heaven. Not a single one. There's not a single set of actions that you can fulfill that will get you to heaven. No amount of good deeds will get you to heaven. That can only come through faith in Christ. But I also recognize that if we call ourselves Christians, the word Christian literally means like Christ. And if we're going to call ourselves that, then I think we should maybe pay more attention to how like him we are in our life. Because when I read his story, when I read the story of Jesus when he was here in the flesh, every breath that he had, every ounce of energy that he had, was poured into spreading the gospel and benefiting other people. So in the context of that, how Christian are we? I'm going to invite you to come down to the altar. There's an altar here. There's an altar in the back. And I'm going to lead us in prayer. I'll give you just a second.
We ask that you empower our words, empower our actions. God, guide us to the things that we should do and give us the resolve to follow you. We pray these things in Christ's name.
come together and come to you with just humble, thankful. God, we're so thankful to be able to call ourselves yours. We are thankful for the opportunity to serve you alongside our family. God, but to steal the words of a preacher I heard a long time ago, I don't remember his name, but you do. God, you didn't save us to sit. You saved us to serve. God, you sent your son, and he lived his entire life committing every breath and every action to serve us and others, to spreading the gospel, to building the church. God, we pray that the same thing would be said about us. That we would give every last ounce of devotion that we have and serve recognize that life here in comparison to eternity is very short. And God, we ask that you help us to keep that in mind. And we ask that you help us to live according to it. Building up treasure there. And sharing your truth here. So that others can partake with us. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we're going to be in the book of James again. The book of James, chapter 2. James, chapter 2. We're going to begin in verse 14. But before we dive in there, while you're finding your place in the book of James, we have reached a passage in the book of James that is considered extremely controversial. This passage uh, is a very in-your-face passage. It, it's, it can be an intimidating passage. It can be a life-changing passage. It is an unapologetic passage for what James is saying. This passage has made many people very angry. This passage can be a life-altering passage. And if you pay attention this morning, this passage can be a, a life-saving <coughs> passage. If there is one message that I wish that you would pay extremely close attention to throughout the entire book of James, it is this passage. It is this message. If you haven't heard another message that I've preached since I've been here, my desire is that you would hear this message, this passage. I want to quote... Pastor Bob Utley. He said, this is the most significant theological passage in the entire book of James. Jack Graham, another Southern Baptist preacher, pastor of the word for many, many years, said this. He says, this is one of, if not the most frightening passages in all of the Bible. Because it is possible to believe in God and believe in Jesus Christ and die and wake up in hell. If 
I were to expand on that, I would say that it is possible to believe in Jesus Christ. It is possible to come to church week after week, year after year, be a faithful tither, and die and wake up in hell. Summing that up, it is possible to think that you are really saved <coughs> and be really deceived. It is possible to think that you are saved when you are indeed actually lost. This can be a very difficult passage for many people. It's because in the Southern Baptist Church we've been told, we once saved, always saved. Just come down and repeat this prayer after me and ask Jesus into your heart. And then those people, because they made a profession of faith when they were nine years old, they're saved because we believe once saved, always saved. But you see, that they, they made that profession, but yet nothing ever changed in their entire life. They have no relationship with Christ. The reality of that is, is that we all know people like that. We all know people who profess to know Jesus Christ in their life, but yet when you look at their life, they look nothing like Jesus Christ. What James is going to tell us this morning is that type of faith is a dead faith. That is a faith that really does not know Jesus Christ. And that's why this passage can make people angry. Because we know people like this, but yet we refuse to, to accept the words of James in this passage because we've been taught and we believe that once saved, always saved, that I do believe that once you truly come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you cannot lose that. The question then is, do they really know Jesus Christ? Were they really saved when they made that original Profession, And that's what we're going to look at this morning. So I challenge you to, to bear with me through this text. This is a text that might make you upset. It might make you angry, as it has done many that have come before us. Because it's a challenging passage. But we're going to address these issues this morning in the book of James, starting in verse 14. If you found your place, I'm going to invite you to go ahead and stand with me for the reading of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. Verse 14 says, What does it profit, my brethren? If someone says he has faith but does not, but does not have works, can, say, can faith save him? Excuse me. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace and be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works, faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see that, that, a, that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out of their way? For the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. I said this was a challenging passage this morning. I want to bring you the most challenging passage. Real faith or really deceived? Do you have real faith or are you really deceived? Do you have true faith or are you truly deceived? Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come to you now. Father, as we look at the words of James here about dead faith, God, I pray that you would Speak to our hearts this morning. I pray that you would set our distractions aside. I pray that we would understand the words of James here accurately and what he is actually saying in this passage and in this text. Father God, I pray that you would hide me behind your cross, that you would speak through me, that you would give me the words that your congregation needs to hear, that your people this morning need to hear. Father, most of all, I pray that if there's anyone in here that has this type of faith this morning that this passage is talking about, 
God, give them understanding. Open their eyes to the sense of dead faith that this passage is referring to. Father God, draw them out of the darkness and into the light and show them what true, real faith looks like. Father God, we give you this time. And we ask this in the name of every other name, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to talk about true faith this morning. We're going to talk about real faith this morning, but we're also going to talk about a couple of other types of faith. You see, James has outlined for us, basically what I see in this passage is three different types of faith. There's three types of faith in this passage. The first type of faith that James outlines for us this morning is a dead faith. We're going to start in verse 14. Verse 14 says, What does it profit, my brother, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? And just so we're all on the same page here this morning, I want you to read that, and I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to ask you the same question that James is asking here, and I want you to reply. After I ask you this first question, I'm going to ask you another secondary question, and I want you to not reply. I want you to keep that one to yourself. But, to start. If someone says he has faith but does not have works, can that faith save him? If you say the answer to that question is yes, let me see your hand. If you say the answer to that question is no, let me see your hand. Not everybody in here has answered, but the bulk of you have said no, which means not very many people in here think that this type of faith is a saving faith. We're going to break this down. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? There's two things I want to really outline here in verse 14. First, when you see that can faith save him, he, James is talking about a certain type of faith. You can almost pencil in that type of faith. Can this kind of faith save him, or can that kind of faith save him? Okay? What James is talking about here is a, is a faith that has no works. And James is saying, can this type of faith that has no works, can that type of faith really save a man? Right? This is a person who's, who's professing to be a believer. They're, they're claiming to know Jesus Christ. They've got all the talk, but they've got no walk. And James is saying, can that type of faith, can this emptiness of works really save them? It's a rhetorical question, and James is getting at no. That type of faith is not a real saving faith. It's an empty faith. It's a dead faith, and we're going to see that. He gives us this example or illustration. This is what I really love about the book of James. Every passage, he really breaks it down, and he gives you his own examples. He gives you these illustrations, just like he's preaching it to you. Here's his example in verse 15. He says, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace and be warmed and filled, but you're not given the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Okay? He's not saying that they're literally naked. What, what he's saying here is, if someone comes to you in need, they're, they're hungry, their clothes are tattered and torn, they have nowhere to go, they have, they have nothing available to them, and you say, Go and God will be with you. We'll, we'll, we'll pray for you. That type of faith is dead. He's saying, if you don't do something for these people, if you don't give them clothes, if you don't give them money for food, if you don't help these people in need, what kind of faith really is that? What kind of faith is this? And this is going back to verse 14 when he says, if someone says that he has faith, this is this verbal type of faith. That you say you have faith, but yet you don't do anything about it. There's no action from this faith. I want to quote Matthew 7, 21 through 23 for you. It says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That's what this is talking about. These people profess to know Jesus Christ, yet their actions say nothing about it. Verse 17, thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Faith without works is dead. If, you're, if your faith, if your words don't lead to, act, lead to action, it, it's just words. That's what he's saying here. It's empty words because there's no evidence of works. And, and the controversy in this passage is this. 
do I, do I have to do good works to enter the kingdom of heaven? That's where those people get this passage from. People who believe that it is by works that you are justified before God are getting it from James chapter 2. They're saying that I have to believe and do good works to enter the kingdom of heaven. But that's not what James is saying here. James is saying that a real faith will produce works. It's not that you have to do the works. I've heard religion described this way. Religion is something that I have to do, something that I don't like to do, that I have to do to be good in God's eyes. A relationship with Jesus Christ is doing those things because you love who Jesus Christ is. But religion to some people is, oh, I have to go to church because that's what our religion is. I have to pray. I have to read my Bible. That's not what religion is all about. That's not what religion is. This is what James is saying here. He's saying it's dead faith. You're just saying and professing that you believe in Christ. Your words aren't leading to any action. Now the conflict here, again, is do we have to maintain good works to enter the kingdom of heaven? Right? Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves this is the gift of God, lest anyone should boast. Most of you know that verse by heart, right? How many of you know what verse 10 says? Not very many people know what verse 10 says, but most everybody can say, I know about Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you are saved. I got that one. Let's look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, what? For good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So the controversy here is, is James contradicting Paul, or is Paul contradicting James? Are we saved by faith? Are we saved by grace in God through faith? Or are we saved because of our faith and works? And this is where critics have said James and, and Paul are, are fighting one another. They're contradicting one another. Maybe the Bible is contradicting one another. That's why people believe that they have to maintain good works to go to heaven. But see, Paul and James here are not fighting one another. What they're doing is they're fighting back to back. They're fighting two different enemies. The same enemy, two different battles, right? Paul is fighting legalism here, saying that you can't work your way into heaven. Right? There, there, back in Bible days, there were people who were trying to uphold the law to the point saying that if we, if we do all of these things, and people still do this today, we would get to go into heaven. James is fighting easy believism. So on one hand, we have legalism. On the other hand, we have easy believism. James is fighting the easy believism side, saying people are just saying, well, I believe in Jesus Christ, so therefore I don't have to do anything about it. I just get to go to heaven because I profess and because I believe. That's easy believism. Paul's saying he's fighting those people who are the legalistic side, saying you have to do everything to the T to enter heaven. Do you see the two different arguments there? They're both fighting the same argument, but two different ways. You cannot have faith without works. That's what they're both saying, but they're both saying it in two different manners. You will have faith, or excuse, excuse me, you will have works because you have faith. So James is talking about this, this dead faith that people have. People that profess to know Jesus Christ, but yet their life looks nothing like Jesus. I want to show you the second type of faith that James is going to talk about this morning. In verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? The second type of faith I want to show you this morning, after you can have a dead faith that has no works, is a demonic faith. Did you know you can have a demonic faith? Type of faith. And I'm not saying that you're believing in demons here. What I'm getting at is you can have the same type of faith that demons have. Okay? Again, James is speaking here. Verse 18. But someone will say, there's some different interpretations here. Some people say that this is James just being kind and he's saying, but I will say, or these people might be um, on James' side, or some people say that these people contradict James. But what I believe this is saying, James is speaking here like the third person. He's saying, but James will say, essentially, you have faith, and I have works. Show me 
your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Then he goes into verse 19. This is good. You believe that there is one God. Scholars believe that this is referring back to the Shema in Deuteronomy, and that may be true. But it's almost as if James has a little bit of sarcasm in his voice here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you believe that there's one God, you do good, you do well. But even the demons believe and tremble. That drives the question, what do demons believe? What do demons actually believe? Number one, demons believe in God. Number one, don't miss this. Demons believe in God. Mark chapter 1, verse 23 and 24 says, Now there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. You know, demons believe in God. Demons believe in the one true God. Number two, they believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Mark chapter 3, verse 11. And the unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried out, saying, You are the Son of God. The third thing that they believe. They know the Bible, and they know it well. Matthew chapter 4, verse 6. And he said to him, this is Satan, and he said to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written in the Word of God, he's quoting Scripture, he shall give the angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. You see, Satan and demons believe in God. They believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and they know the Bible, and they know what it says. The fourth thing is they believe in Him. Luke chapter 8, verse 31. And they begged Him that they would not command Him to go out into the abyss. There's a lot of preachers, there's a lot of pastors, there's a lot of people who intended to do a lot of good, spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. Like, if you'll just believe in God, and if you'll just believe in Jesus Christ, and confess that you're a sinner, that you'll go to heaven. But the problem there is that they, they don't confess that they're a sinner, and they don't really, they might recognize that they've done something wrong, but there's no repentance, right? There's recognition of who God is and who Christ is, but there's no repentance from sin. I heard a preacher say, you could have a demon in the form of a person come in the back door of the church. And you would ask them if they came forward for church membership, they would say, do you believe in God? Yep, I believe in God. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Yep, I believe in Jesus Christ. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who came in the form of a man, died on the cross, was resurrected on the third day, ascended, and is alive today, sitting at the right hand of God the Father? And they would say, yep, believe all that. Do you believe that he's coming back again one day? Yep, believe that too. Do you believe in heaven and hell? Yep, believe that too. Are you willing to repent? And are you willing to follow Jesus Christ as Lord of your life? Nope. There's the difference. There's the difference. There's a lot of people walking around that have a demonic type of faith. They believe in God. The real God, the one God, the only true God. They believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross, was resurrected on the third day, and it is alive today, sitting at the right hand of the Father. But there's no repentance in their life. There's no lordship in their life. They have the same type of faith that demons have in the Bible. You know, it says in verse 20, or excuse me, verse 19. He says, even the demons believe and tremble. I think a lot of times the demon have a more accurate faith than what some people profess to have. They actually tremble. Another word for this would be shudder. 
They, they come before God fearful. How many people come before God in fear and, and tremble? I would say not very many. I was, as I was looking at this and as I was thinking about this, I thought about my dog. My dog can get into the trash can and scatter garbage all over the floor. My dog's name is Remy. And I can say, Remy, come here. And that dog will put her tail beneath her legs and come crawling to my feet, shivering, shuddering, and trembling before her master. That's what this is talking about. That's what this is saying. That demons have the same type of fear, that dog probably even more so, than that dog has with me. I can treat that dog. I don't have to do anything to the dog. The dog knows that the dog has done wrong. And the dog knows who her boss is and who her master is. And she is fearful for what is coming next. Even the demons believe and tremble. How many people have a fearful faith in God? You know, there's a lot of people that, that know about God, but they don't know God. You know, if you look at American statistics, depending on which site you go to, the American statistics for Christians are somewhere between 50 and 90 percent, depending on what you what, what site you view. 50 to 90 percent of Americans say they believe in God. They believe in Jesus Christ. They know about God, yet they don't know God. You see, even, even the demons have the doctrine right. Even the demons have the theology right. They're, they're theological majors. They're doctrinal majors. They know the Bible inside and out. They know the truth. They don't accept it. There's a difference. There's a difference. That's the second type of faith, a demonic type of faith. I'm going to give you some synonyms for what I think dead and demonic faith really are. Summarize both of these in one category. Dead faith and demonic faith are this. They are first dead. Secondly, they are deceived. They are disguised. They are discouraged, and they are disobedient. All of those could summarize a dead faith. They're a disobedient faith because they're not adherent to the word of God. There's no repentance. They're a discouraged faith because they have nothing to put their faith in. They have no hope. They have no trust. It's disguised because they, they look like they could be real Christians, but yet they're not. It's, it's, it's deceiving those around us. But there's a third type of faith that James talks about this morning. And I've labeled this one, it's a different faith. It's a different faith. You see, there's something about this faith that's different from all of the other types of faiths out there. Whether it be a dead faith, whether it be a demonic faith, uh, a disguised faith, a discouraged, whatever those are, there's a different type of faith. James talks about it in verse 21 through 26. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by his by his faith? By excuse me, by works, faith was made perfect. Verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works? When she received the messengers and sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. You see, James gives us these two examples here. He gives us the example of Abraham, and then he gives us the example of Rahab, of what true faith really looks like. And if you ask me, he couldn't have used any two different examples. First, Abraham is a man. Rahab's a woman. Abraham's a Jew. Rahab's a Gentile. Abraham is a, a faithful follower of God. He's he is the father of the believers, the father of the Jews. You have Rahab here who is she's a prostitute. You've got two people on the opposite ends of the spectrum here. But yet he uses both of them. The first one he uses is Abraham. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? When he, was off, when he offered his Isaac, his son, on the altar. And then verse 22 do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works, faith was made perfect? And this is the interesting part. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God. Now, you need to put this in context, right? You need to understand the process, the timeline here. Verse 20 says, he says, was Abraham our father justified works 
just by by his works. That's talking about in Genesis 22 when he actually went to the altar to sacrifice his son. He was justified by his works when he went to offer his son. But then skip down to verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled back in Genesis 15, verse 6, which says, Abraham believed in God and it was accounted to him for righteousness sake. So in chapter 15 of Genesis, that's where Abraham was justified before God. When he believed. Now scripture was fulfilled through his works in Genesis chapter 22. I want to quote to you John MacArthur and what he had to say about this. And maybe this will clear it up for you. He says, Abraham was justified by faith before God. But he was justified before men by his works. You see the difference there? He was justified before God back in Genesis chapter 15 when he believed. He was justified before men in Genesis 22 through his works. He continued to say, John MacArthur, works are the only way his faith can be seen by others as real saving faith. You see, what I, through my studies, I, I found out that this word justified actually has two meanings in the Bible. In the New Testament, it can mean justified before God, but it can also mean justified before men. So you have to understand the context here. Abraham was justified before works by, in front of men, that they saw his faith as true, living, alive faith, but he was justified before God through his belief in God. And it was accounted to him for righteousness sake. So he was declared righteous. He was declared justified, declared righteous, in Genesis 15, he was shown righteous through his works in Genesis 22. Then he gives a second example. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? And we all know the story about Rahab taking in uh, the men and hiding them so they wouldn't be killed. Same, it's the same principle here. All he's doing is echoing with another example. And he says, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. I've been talking about, throughout, throughout the past weeks, about looking for repetition, repeating words in Scripture. I want to give you a few of these. First off, there's three examples in this passage. There's an example in the dead faith, there's an example in the demonic faith, and there's two examples in the different faith. Okay? Three times in this passage does James say, faith without works is dead. Three times. Verse 17, verse 20, and verse 26. Then James couples faith with works in this passage ten times. Ten times do you find faith with works coupled together. Verse 14, 17, it's three times coupled together in verse 18. Verse 20, verse 24, 26, and two times in verse 22. Ten times. Then justified by works is found three times. Justified by works in verse 21. Justified by works in verse 24. And justified by works in verse 25. There's a point here. James is trying to make. He's trying to get it through our heads that there is something different about these people. I want to give you a few verses. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. This is one of my favorite Bible verses. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. There's something different about people who have this different type of faith, this real living faith. There's something different. They're, they're new creatures. New creatures. Sorry. Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And listen to this. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. And the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Ezekiel 11, verses 19 and 20. I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. That they may walk in my statutes and keep 
my rules and obey them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. You see, there's something different about true believers who have a true living faith. And I want to give you some comparisons here. I'm going to talk about a dead faith, and we're going to talk about a living faith. A dead faith has no brokenness over sin. A living faith are broken. Those people are broken over the sin in their lives. You have brokenness and non-brokenness. Dead faith, there's no lordship. Living faith, they acknowledge Jesus as Lord. Dead faith, there's no surrender. Living faith, they surrender their life to Christ. And no matter what that means, what, what that may bring. Dead faith, no repentance. Living faith, repentance from sin. Dead faith, no obedience to the word of God. Living faith strives to obey the word of God. Dead faith, no love for Christ. A living faith loves Jesus Christ. If you are sitting in here this morning and you have no love for Jesus Christ, my friend, you are lost. Dead faith, no love for his word. A living faith loves spending time in the word of God. A dead faith has no love for others. A living faith has a growing love for others. A dead faith has no works. A living faith says that you will have works, and those works will prove that you're a new creation in Christ. A dead faith has no fruit. The Bible says a living fruit. You will know them by the fruits that are there. There are differences between these two people. There are differences between a dead faith and an alive faith. And that's what James is getting at here. I asked you a question at the beginning, back in verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can, they, can, that, say, can that faith even save him? Let's ask that question again. Do you think that faith can save him? Let's say yes. Raise your hand. Now that we've gone through this briefly. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that type of faith save him if you say no? Raise your hand. Got a few more no's. I'm going to ask you that second question. Then why is it that when we have friends, family members, co-workers, neighbors, whoever the case may be, when it's people we know and they fall into that category, and they, we know that they've walked an aisle and they've said a prayer, but yet they have zero works in their life, they have zero fruit in their life, they live a life that is unchanged by the word of God. Why do we still say, well, praise God when they die because they're going to end up in heaven because at nine years old, they said a prayer and accepted Jesus Christ. You just told me that you believe verse 14 and that type of faith is a dead faith. Then why is it that when we see those same people in life, we say, but praise Jesus because they said a prayer and asked him into his heart. Why do we do that? I'm not looking for an answer. People want nothing to do with Jesus Christ Monday through Saturday, yet they want to spend eternity with him. It makes no sense. Why do you want to spend eternity with Jesus Christ if you want nothing to do with him Monday through Saturday? Heaven isn't the reward. Jesus Christ is the reward. Let me ask you this, and I've asked other people this one, but I'm talking to them about salvation because what, what most people say to me is, and what I just got done telling you is, I think I'm saved, but they don't have that assurance, they don't really know, but it's because I said this prayer when I was 10 years old. And then I want to ask them this. If you're claiming to be saved, you are claiming to have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. How has the Holy Spirit changed your life. If you claim to have the Holy Spirit living within you, you should be living a changed life. How has your life changed after receiving the Holy Spirit? How is your life different? James is saying a life without change is a lost life. We are doing friends, families, Neighbors, coworkers, we are doing them no favors by saying, yeah, you're going to go to heaven because you said that prayer. 
The Bible says you will know them by the fruits that they bear. If there is no works, if there is no evidence of a changed life, James is saying that is a dead faith. You have the same faith as the demons. You will know them by their fruit. You will know an apple tree because it bears apples. You will know a banana tree because it bears bananas. You will bear. You will know an orange tree because it bears oranges. We could go down the list, right? The point is this morning in closing. I gave you the statistic: fifty to ninety percent of Americans believe in God. They believe in Jesus Christ. They believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross, rose from the dead. They have good theology. They have good doctrine. They have great orthodoxy. They have no relationship with Jesus Christ. There is no love. seen a change in your life. You're, you're acting the same way that you that, that you did before you said that you accepted him. And my friend, because I love you, I've got to tell you that the Bible says that that's the same type of faith that the demons have. The demons don't believe that. I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know if you have a dead faith. I don't know if you have a demonic faith. I don't know if you have that different type of faith that we talked about. But you can have it this morning. You can have a different type of faith. A faith that's real. A faith that's alive. Let me tell you this. A faith that radically changes your life. I had a conversation with my mother a week ago. I said, there are people in my life who don't know about me. Because what I see in Scripture, I see the Apostle Paul radically changed. I see the disciples becoming apostles when they received the Holy Spirit. And they turn from, we talked about this on Wednesday night, they go from scared disciples to bold apostles. When they are given the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit radically changes their lives. And she said, yeah, but they were all called to preach. Tell me the Holy Spirit affected them. And it made sense at the time. The more I think about it, the more I'm like, the Holy Spirit can do the same thing for you that he did for them. He can radically change who you are. And I don't. I want to go a step further, and I don't want to say that he, he can do that. I'm going to say that he will do that, and he should do that. Because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, that we are new creations in Christ. We are a new creature. All things of the old have passed away, and now it's, everything is new. You don't look at life the same way. If that's what Scripture says, why do we still profess people who have said a prayer and asked Jesus into their heart and yet don't look any different? Why do we still say, yep, they're saved, they're going to heaven? It's contradictory to the Word of God. Contradictory to what I see and read. I'm going to pray for us, folks. We'll be open. If you want to talk, I'd, be lo- I'd love to talk to you. I'd love to talk to you about what real faith is. If you've got somebody on your heart, maybe that the Lord is leading you to pray for, come to the altar and pray for that person. And if you know that they've got a dead or demonic type of faith, come pray for them. Pray that God would show them the truth, open their eyes. Draw them out of darkness and into the light. Give them a real relationship. Give them a different type of faith. Heavenly Father, God, we come to you this morning. Father, as we mentioned at the beginning of this text, that this is a challenging text. This is a challenging passage. This, This passage hits a lot of us where we're uncomfortable. 
God, this text can anger many people because the reality is that we all know people that have this type of faith, that have a, that have a, a profession, but they've got no action. They, they claim to know you, yet there's no fruit in their life. There's nothing different about them. Thank God, I know it's difficult to admit that those people are most likely lost. According to the word of God, according to your word, Lord, they're lost. You say that we will know them by the fruits that they bear. God, if we're honest with ourselves this morning, may we examine our own lives. May we, may we examine our own fruit. And do we have those differences that we talked about? Do we have obedience? Do we have a love for God? Do we have a love for Jesus Christ? A love for his word? A love for others? A growing relationship? Do we have repentance? Do we have obedience? Do we have the things that Scripture say that we should have if we have a real faith? God, are we, do we have a true faith or are we truly deceived this morning? God, I believe there are many in this country that are truly deceived. There's a lot of people that think they're going to die and wake up in heaven.